you know, I love the way the Lord works and, uh, you know, how, how the songs just lined up as I was preparing uh, this week and I was trying to, to land on where, where I would, I would uh, preach from. And I just kept thinking about how, you know, we're headed into Pentecost Sunday and we're, we're coming away from Easter. And uh, <clears throat> I just kept thinking that we need to return to, to some of the basics of what, what we are as a church. And if you're not aware, we are a Pentecostal church. We were born on the day of Pentecost. And uh, the Pentecostal church is really a, a restorationist movement. It's uh, getting back to the, to the original. Uh, you know, you hear so many people today, but I just don't, I don't trust organized religion. I think it ought to be back the way it used to be. We believe that. We believe that. We believe that, uh, that on the day of Pentecost, the church was born, that people were empowered, that people were saved, and, and just the church literally exploded. Um, <clears throat> you see, here's the thing. We've got to remember that the church is not just a building. Uh, you know, so often in our vernacular, and, and uh, you know, I don't beat people up about it because I use the vernacular too, that I'm going to church and, I, and I'm thinking about a building. Or I'm going to church, I'm going to an event on Sunday morning. But although we use that language, we, we can't let that get into our spirit. That the church is a building. That church is an event we attend on Sunday mornings or, or whenever you gather. No, we are the church. My uncle uh, was, was kind of upset because this woman that lived next to their church uh, was not being taken care of. And he, he goes to his pastor and said, Pastor, something ought to be done. You know, she was, there was some lack in her, uh, there's, I think that her house needed to be fixed up or whatever. The church needs to do something about that. He said, well, and this was a wise pastor. He said, well, it sounds like you've got a burden for that. Well, somebody needs to do something. He said, well, it seems like the Lord's calling you to it. You know, it became not such quite a big deal in his life when it became his responsibility. You see, we are the church. Sometimes we say, well, it seems like the church would do blah, 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 blah. You're the church. Let's get after it. And we, we can only do that through the power of the Holy Spirit. You and I are the church, and the church is empowered and filled by the Holy Spirit Himself. The Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was out form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Bible said that the Spirit of God hovered over the earth. And He began to call forth order out of chaos. And, and we know the story of creation. And God created man and placed him in a garden. And there's a, it, we're going to talk, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to take from, uh, some of you have been through my teaching on the, the Holy Spirit. And I'm going to take from some of that today. So it's going to be a little bit different. I, I want to uh, go back to some of the basics of what it means to be people of the Spirit and what it means to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, what it means to walk in the Spirit-filled life. And there is a poem that uh, my brother and sister-in-law's pastor, Tom Sturban, wrote that I think encapsulates what it means to be people who pursue the Holy Spirit and what that relationship look like. Relationship should look like. It's called Unhidden, a reason for worship. And I want to read it for you. It, it's got a little bit of link to it, but it, I think it's going to be important to, to really get this and it begins to paint the picture of what it means to, to follow after the Spirit. He writes, the air was brisk and invigorating. It had the just after a spring rain smell and feel, and yet there was no ring or rain or spring for that matter. It was another day in Eden, the garden of perfection. The temperature was perfect. It was not too cold or too hot, too humid or too dry. It was just, well, perfect. A gentle breeze was blowing. You could hear it in the leaves of the tree. And then another sound. It was the sound of Him. The sound of Him in the garden. He was coming to meet face to face again as He did each day. It was God the Holy. Holy is always more, always beyond. More than comp they can be comprehended. More than can be expressed. The God who is, who was, and who will always be more. Each day they were filled by the encounter with God the Holy. And yet each day there was somehow more to be received. Each day was complete and full and whole, and yet 
every next moment in His presence was somehow more completing and more feeling and more wonderful and more animating. It was transforming. How is it possible? How can you be full and yet be more filled again? Were they becoming more in the very, in the very image of this holy more? Was each encounter increasing their capacity for Him? Yet each day and each encounter with Godly, God the Holy made them. Made them what? He just made them. He made them who were filled even more, even more full. Only holy can fill. Only holy can make whole. Only divine holiness brings transformation to human wholeness. The one who is the I am, what other words were there? Eden and him and them. The only perfected domain of worth and substance the world has ever known. Worth and wholeness in the purest form humanity would ever experience. Unbroken encounter with Him. The shape and substance of human worth from Him, through Him, and to Him. And unchallenged by any other voice or any other opinion. Worth shaping, worthship, worship. For this all too brief space and time, mankind lived in an environment of uncontested worship. It happens in its purest form when God is the sole source of worth and identity. Everything else is just deception. Then the serpent hissed. We know the story. Now another opinion. Deception succeeded. Fear was birthed. Mankind hid. Why do we hide? Why do we hide? Deception. Sin entered. Death now ruled. It was the last day in Eden. The Garden of Holy was abandoned. From the beginning, mankind's endless exposure to the Holy More of God has always left them with the awareness that they too were more, more than enough. Only worship of God the Holy satiates the cry of the human heart for enoughness. Only His presence can fill their capacity and hunger for holy more of Him was now forever a part of the human soul. It was built in the very essence of who they were. There was a place in them that only God the Holy could fill. Their capacity and hunger for the holy more of Him was now forever a part of the human soul. But now they would be cursed and sentenced to an existence of less, all the while having been built for more. Wow. Wow. I want to read that one again. But now they would be cursed and sentenced to an existence of less, all the while having been built for more. You see, humankind is composed in a manner that only God the Holy can fully satisfy the hunger of the soul for more. But without holy, nothing is ever enough. Now the real issue of human pain surfaces. Humanity was made for Him, designed for more, and now relegated to a world of less. Their world was no longer the flourishing garden of more, but an arid wasteland of never enough. So begins the aimless wandering search of satisfying the appetite for more in anything and everything that might appear to offer more, only to discover again and again and again it's all deception. In the last day of Eden, they abandon the garden of God. The only thing they take with them from the garden are the things that God never intended to be there in the first place. They are deception, fear, and hiding. These three now are the new trinity of worth and worship mankind exchanged for the trinity of the holy more they had known and worshipped and walked with every day, deceived as to who they are, fearful they will never be enough, hiding from God, from others, and from themselves. God was not done. He would bring mankind back to true unhidden worship, even though the journey would be long and painful and the price to be paid would be far greater than anyone could possibly conceive. But God the Holy would pay the cost. His love for creation could not leave them forever hiding and separated from Him. The quest to recover worship would begin here for both God and man. Mankind would make it back to unhidden worship, although they would never make it back to Eden. But for God, it was never about life in the garden. It was always about life with the gardener. And so it would be nearly 4,000 years later, very early on a Sunday morning, in another garden just outside the empty tomb, God the Holy would return. He was mistaken for the gardener. Heaven laughed, but it was really no mistake. The gardener 
had indeed returned. Wow. 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 So we see God has designed us for more. God has designed us for far more. But I'm afraid, church, that so often we are relegated to the lowlands of life. We're relegate, relegated to arguments. We're relegated to the, to the here and now. I say so often that I'm afraid that too many times I spend my focus and I, I spend my energy on that that is loud, that that is uh, present in my face. But when really the more is alone with Him. The more is something that happens in the spirit world. You see, it is because Jesus came. The gardener came because Jesus came. He lived that sinless life. He was crucified. He was resurrected. That we have this power available to us today. Paul wrote that if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is in vain and our faith is also in vain and we are still in our sins. You see, there's something about the resurrection that releases the power of the Holy Spirit into our lives. You see, it is more than just a day to be celebrated. As I, as I think about all the issues that we face today, all the, all the complexities of, of modern life, and we think, what is a story that happened thousands of years ago? How does it have application to my life? I'm reminded of the story of Lazarus in the Bible. Jesus said, Lazarus is sick. Mary and Martha, Lazarus' sister, sent word to Jesus for him to come quickly. But guess what happened? Jesus waited. How many has ever had to wait? How many has ever felt like Jesus was about four days too late? The Lord, if you don't act now, Lord, if you don't move right now, the Lord, I just don't know what's going to happen on the other side of, of this moment. But sometimes we wait. If you've been a Christian for any length of time, you've had seasons of waiting. You've had seasons where it seemed like that Jesus waited just beyond when you thought that things were going to be just come to a crashing uh, stop. But Jesus waited. He didn't show up the entire time that Lazarus was sick. I don't know how long that process was, but it was a long time, enough time for him to die until finally Lazarus died. And still, Jesus didn't show up. And four days later, Jesus came to the place where His friends had laid uh, their brother. And when Martha heard that Jesus was near, she ran out to meet Him and said, Lord, if you had only been here, my brother would have not have died. And Jesus said, your brother will rise again. And she responded like a lot of people in today's world responds today, and sometimes we do. She said, yeah, I know He's going to rise again at the resurrection of the last day. And she kind of responded like a lot of people do. Yeah, I know about the resurrection the last day, but how does that help me today? See, sometimes we live our life, we know the Word of God. We, we know our doctrine. We know what we believe up here. I mean, it's all, so often, we live, I say a lot of times we live from our hearts. That's why we were, I mean, when you touch something hot, you don't have to sit there and calculate, should I move my finger? It just happens. If somebody cuts you off on uh, in traffic, you don't have to decide. You know, if you're not careful, you can respond from the gut, and you can respond in a in an emotional way. So the problem is not that we don't know, so we don't translate that into into our daily lives. That can only be done through the power of the Holy Spirit. So so Martha says, "How can that help me today?" You see, the resurrection is not merely a day on the calendar, but as a person. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. Paul said to the Corinthians that the resurrection of Jesus, in, in the resurrection that Jesus became a life-giving spirit. In Christ, all shall be made alive. And if we simply put our trust in Jesus today, we'll have the greatest power of the universe available to us. Paul wrote to the Romans that the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, dwells in you. He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. Amen. Give life to your mortal bodies his, uh, through His Spirit who dwells in you. You know, I, I, I hate the way sometimes Christians can, can give cliches to people going through hard times in life. 
you know, the problems of life are, are complex and a lot of times the answers can't be fit onto a bumper sticker. So I'm not big on t-shirts and bumper stickers and all that stuff because life is more complex than that. It's more complex than that. So I'm not here to say that, you know, the, the, the answers to, to modern life are easy. They're not easy. They're simple, but they're not easy. Simple meaning, you see, the church, I'm afraid we, we, we're, the, the world, and they tried it with Jesus. I, I love the way Jesus, who's always in the Spirit, you know, uh, when it came to taxes, you know, he could have said, you know, I just don't think we ought to be paying taxes. But he said, whose ins who's inscription is on that coin? To render unto Caesar that which is Caesar. He never allowed himself to be pulled into arguments, but he always walked in lockstep with his father. And in church, if we are to be effective, we're going to be just a, a byword. And I'm afraid it's happening in the church. We're, we're becoming just a uh, just an old relic, an old fixture. Uh, I don't want the church to become like malls. It's a place you used to go to. It's a place that used to be a, a, effective. I don't want the church to be that way. I want the church to be what God has called it to be. And if we're pulled down to an argument, if we're just clinging on to an old dusty story, but it must be something alive in us. And that can only be through the power of the Holy Spirit. Jesus said in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest parts of the earth. Now, I want you to think about this. Here's a bunch of guys that was from Galilee. That was like being where I'm from. They were from the sticks. They had never been anywhere. They were just a bunch of blue-collar guys. And Jesus says, guys, you're going to take this message and you're going to continue my work. You're going to take it uh, to Jerusalem. You're going to take it to Judea, Samaria, even around the world. You're going to take this. And he said, behold, I am sending forth the promise of my Father upon you, but you're to stay in this city until you're clothed with power from on high. Now, let's really imagine how these guys must have felt when Jesus said, guys, you know, these guys were scared to death. When, when they came to, to get Jesus in the garden that night, what did they do? They scattered. They, were, they couldn't keep it together. One minute, uh, Peter was saying, you know, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And next minute, he's, you know, t blaspheming. And Jesus had him saying, get behind me, Satan. So these guys were kind of all over the page. And Jesus looks at these guys, the, the, these men that he had poured into for three years. And he said, guys, you've got to continue to work. This was just the beginning. They kind of, he was saying, look, guys, I got to go away. And they're thinking that's the end. But he said, no, I, it's good that I'm going away because if I don't go away, the comforter will not come. So I'm so glad that Jesus said, wait and, and tarry in the city until you're clothed with power from on high. Now, it seems that a task so daunting, they ought to get right at it. You would think that, that something that was so monumental of a task that they would be instructed, like guys, get right after it. He said, no, I want you to go and you wait until you're empowered by the Holy Spirit, until the, until the promise of the Father is sent. Now, as I've said earlier, the, the problems of today are complex. They're, they seem bigger than they've ever been. But how many know there's nothing new under the sun? Sometimes we feel like, you, know, you hear people say things are worse than they've ever been. No, they, they've been just as bad. We just have internet and can see everything that's happening all at one time. So, you know, there's, there's always been problems. There's always been debauchery. There's always been sin. There's always been an enemy to attack the church. I mean, I haven't been stoned lately, have you? I haven't been crucified upside down lately. I mean, there are some things that that early church... People say, well, I just wish it could be like it was in the early church. I don't know. You, you might not want that. So you may be a little intimidated about uh, the, the pressure that the church is under, that what it means to be a Christian in today's society. But those early disciples of Jesus must have felt the same way. 
We believe the charge that Jesus gave the, the apostles of lies to us today. Wait until you're clothed with power from on high. Don't you go out of those doors while the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Don't you stand before a, a, just a demonic filled generation. Just a generation that is confused. A generation that doesn't know, uh, you know right from wrong. That, that is calling evil good and good evil. Don't you dare go out into that generation to declare the word of the Lord unless you've been empowered by the Holy Spirit. Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 5, verse 16, 16 and 17, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For those are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. The walk that Paul talks about there in the letter to the Galatians is the way that we live our lives. In his letter, Paul is calling us to live in the Spirit. You see, I believe this. The Spirit-filled life reaches beyond a one-time experience. And, and, and I'm afraid in the Pentecostal movement, we have done a disservice to a lot of people because we've relegated the spirit life to a one-time experience. Almost like a merit badge that you get. Oh, I got that in 19... 82 or whenever it was I got that badge and I'm good no it's more than a one time experience it reaches beyond that to affect the moment by moment realities of life whether it's in the kitchen on the job or wherever life is lived that is the, the, the life lived in the spirit for a few moments I want to talk about the person of the Holy Spirit you know, uh, Robert Morris, Pastor Robert Morris titled a series about the Holy Spirit of uh, the God I never knew. And I, I like that title because it encapsulates and it perfectly describes the misconceptions that many people have about the Holy Spirit. Because the work in the Holy Spirit is generally invisible, sometimes it's hard to uh, to understand the role of him in our lives. The late Dr. George O. Wood wrote, when we ask the question, who is the Holy Spirit? We recognize our limitations. Because He's God. Only God can describe Himself. But we can use the language of Scripture to begin to understand the Holy Spirit. The first thing I want us to understand is that the Holy, per the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not like Star Wars, some mystical force. He's not a mere experience. He is the third person of the Godhead. You know, I've said so often that even in our, in our singing, sometimes we'll say, send it on down. Or, you know, we relegate him to a, an experience or an emotion. And I think we've got to be careful there. The Holy Spirit is more than an emotion. You see, if, if, we, are, if we are reduced down to just a mere emotion, then any emotion will do. How can we be, how can, if we're all we are is an emotion, then how can we judge another group of people who are not rooted in God's Word, but they, they've got the emotion? We can't be just a people of emotion. We must be people of God's Word. I believe that. I believe that uh, the, the moving of the Holy Spirit moves within the, 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 the shorelines, the, the bank of Scripture. We, next, we see in Scripture the personality of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14, verse 16, it says, And I will pray the Father, and He will give you another comforter, and that He may abide with you forever. In this portion of Scripture, Jesus was saying, I'm going to send someone just like me. The same way that Jesus walked on this earth, and the way that He provided for His people, and uh, his, his disciples, and the way they walked with Him, and He taught them, and He empowered them, He was going to send one just like Himself to walk with His believers. The Holy Spirit has a special responsibility on the earth to take the place of Jesus, to reveal Jesus to the world, and to demonstrate and continue the works that Jesus did while on the earth. What are we supposed to be doing? We're supposed to be allowing the Holy Spirit to work through us to be Jesus to this world. The Holy Spirit is called comforter by Jesus in Scripture. He has the qualities of a person. He has a mind. He has a will. He has feelings and emotion. Uh, he speaks and has hearing. He prays and makes intercession. The Holy Spirit is God and seen in Scripture as a living person, separate and distinct from both the Father and the Son. John the Baptist declared in, in, uh, in Matthew chapter 3, verse 11, I indeed baptize you with water under repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am unworthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. 
You see, the Bible teaches us there are two distinct experiences in the Holy Spirit. Number one, the new believer is saved or born again through the power of the Holy Spirit, but there is yet another work of grace. And we find an example of this in the lives of the early disciples. After his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples and he breathed on them and he said, Receive the Holy Spirit. I believe this, te- this is the moment that teaches us that this was the moment that the fruit of Christ's victory in the cross and the resurrection was realized by the disciples. See, up until that time, their faith was just like every other Old Testament person of faith. Now they were born again through the Spirit. And these same people, after this experience, Jesus told these same people to go and wait in Jerusalem until they received the promise of the Father. And, and again, in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, he said, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are clothed upon with power. Now, when we think about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it's, it's easy to think about it when we think about the baptism in water. Uh, anytime we baptize somebody in water, what happens in this church? We, we, uh, the, the baptizer is the minister. Uh, the person being, or the candidate is the person being baptized. And the element is what? Water. And we immerse them in water. And in the same way, when a person is baptized in the Holy Spirit, they're immersed. Uh, the, the word baptism means to immerse, to be sunk, or to be overwhelmed. The Greeks used the word to describe a sinking ship or a crowd overwhelming a city. Therefore, the baptism of the Spirit means to be immersed in, to be sunk into, or to be overwhelmed in the person of the Holy Spirit, to be drawn along by the power of the Holy Spirit. Remember the Bible said that Jesus was driven into the wilderness by the Holy Spirit. It means to be pulled along by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, we, I want us to, to remember that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a, is a, uh, a separate experience from salvation. In Acts chapter 8, verse 12, it says, But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God in the names of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere, astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. And when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they had already believed in the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. And when they arrived, they prayed for what? These new believers. They were already believers. There that they might receive the Holy Spirit because what? The Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Amen. It's, a, it's a, a, an experience subsequent to and, and separate from salvation. Uh, and it's for all of us. If you've been born again, if you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it is a free gift from God received by, by faith. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And, and listen to who he says it's for. He said, This promise is to you, the people he was speaking to that day. He said, It's to you, your children, to your children, the next generation. And who else? And to all who are far off, and, and he includes us as well. He says, as many as the Lord our God will call. That means you and I here today. If you're wondering if the baptism of the Holy Spirit's for you, Peter said, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Jesus said this. He said, all believers who experience the baptism of the Holy Spirit, you will have rivers of living water flowing out of your heart. He said, he who believes in me, as the scripture said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would receive. We also believe the initial evidence of uh, receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit is speaking in other tongues. In Acts chapter 10, verse 44, the Bible said, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard the word. And those of the circumcision, those Jewish believers who believed were astonished and because they thought this thing is only for us. How many, how many have ever met some people who think that, uh, how many have ever heard those jokes where uh, somebody gets to heaven and they, they're surprised about who all is there? You know, some people act like they're the only ones going. And uh, some of those early believers thought that Christianity was only for, for Jewish believers. And uh, so they were kind of surprised that those of the circumcision who believed were astonished as many as came with Peter 
because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. How did they know it? Verse 46 says, For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Now, you might be asking, so what does all that mean to me? What does the baptism of the Holy Spirit have to do with my life? You see, many people ask the question, what's God's will for my life? And some may wonder, uh, simply wonder, what, what, make, what will make me happy in life? You see, I believe these are the wrong questions. I believe that the, the, uh, those are self-centered questions. The Spirit-empowered life is a God-centered life. Jesus said, my Father is always at work. If you heard me say it one time, you heard me say it a hundred times. God's kingdom is always advancing. How many believe God's kingdom is always advancing? That God is always at work all around us. But what He's looking for, what God was always looking for all throughout His dealings with mankind, He was always looking for a man. He was always looking for a woman who could, He could call into relationship with, a, with Himself. And out of that relationship, He began to work through that person. So what does the baptism of the Holy Spirit have to do with me? In John chapter 16, verse, thir uh, verse 13, it says, But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. And He will not speak on His own. He will speak only what He hears. And He will tell you what, what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine and making it known to you. Amen. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is so vital. It's always been necessary, but in the day and age in which we live, you cannot function as a prophetic voice in this generation. You cannot stand without the baptism of the Holy Spirit and living the Spirit-filled life. As I said earlier, it's not just a merit badge to you get it one time. It's not simply about an emotional high, but it's about our absolute need for divine empowerment. Jesus said, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. You know, sometimes I read that and, and, I, and I understand it up here. But guess how it's lived out in my life? I can't do the big things without Him. I can handle the little things. I can handle the day to day. But how many knows each moment leads into days and days leads into weeks and months and years and a lifetime. If we're not careful, that moment... You see, I believe that the, the Christian life is lived in the moment by moment. You know, here's one thing I say a lot, and I, I believe in it. In it uh, the reason why sometimes our, our prayers or our prayer life seems frustrated uh, is because we're praying about things that God said I wouldn't. He said, you know, don't pray about tomorrow's bread. Pray for this today's bread. He's not going to he's not going to talk to you about tomorrow's bread. So often we're we're trying to we're living way out in in the future. Jesus might come today. But it's in the moment by moment by moment by moment by moment. He said, Without me you can do nothing. God does not give us commands and expect us to fulfill them the best the way that we can. But he wants to do the work through us. The Paracletos, which means help or comforter, has come to continue the work of Jesus through every believer. Here's what the baptism of the Holy Spirit will do. It will equip us with power to witness. It will edify. It will cause our inner man to be uh, our inner inward man to be edified and strengthened. He will enlighten us with guidance. I mean, how I many know there's pitfalls in today's society? Man, there are so many things that our children are having to, to grapple with and there are so many things that we're having to 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 uh, to explain to our children at, at far earlier ages than we wanted to. Boy, I need the I need the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I need wisdom. I need revelation. There are so many questions that man, that preachers back in the day could have never imagined. Christians back in the day never could have imagined some of the things we grapple with today. How many knows we need wisdom from the Holy Spirit, revelation and knowledge? He enables us to pray with power according to the will of God. You know, so uh, James said, you, you pray and you have not because you ask amiss. I need God, the Holy Spirit, to pray through me according to the will of the Father. He empowers us with the ability to flow in spiritual gifts. I believe that every God-ordained church has everything it needs because God equips every believer with spiritual gifts. And as we operate in the power of the Holy Spirit, every church will function as God has ordained and intended. Jesus came to reveal the living God to a hurting world.
And the Holy Spirit has come that the church may reveal a real and a living Jesus to our generation. Amen. Mr. Nice, would you come? Worship team, would you come? We must be people of the Spirit. There was an old Pentecostal preacher, and he would almost cry and say, why don't we try Pentecost one more time? I went to a, it was like a, a month long minister's, um, almost like a, I mean, it was like boot camp Bible college. He taught for eight hours a day. We prayed for, for several hours. And I, and he was, he was up in age and he was just, he was just, he was just, uh, just an amazing man. And I, and I, I don't know, I felt a little funny, but I said, I want to hear how he prays. And I just kind of slid up beside him and I just listened. And he'd almost cry. I said, Lord, let this generation try Pentecost one more time. Let this generation try Pentecost one more time. Oh, church, if we could depend. Now, that word Pentecost, it, it's, it's kind of been loaded down with some things, with tradition and dogma. And so when I say Pentecost, a friend of mine was asked, Do you, we need to get, get back to Pentecost. And he said, well, it depends on what you mean by that. You mean a style of worship or uh, a style of music or, you know, an order of service. I, I, I'm not with that. But if you mean a, a divinely empowered life where we find our worth and we're filled with that holy more and with every encounter we're, we're, we're made to receive more. You see, this world is searching for something to fill because we all have that void in our lives that only holy more can fill. But if the church has lost that, if we've lost that source, if we're looking, as the old country song, looking for love in all the wrong places, if we're looking for fulfillment in all the wrong places, I say with that old Pentecostal preacher, can we try Pentecost one more time? Can we try leaning not on, on our own understanding, but upon the power of the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit, lead us. Holy Spirit, fill us. Forgive us for ever believing that anything else could fill, anything else could bring completion and wholeness and shalom to our lives. Would you stand all over the building today? Lord, I'm guilty. Uh, Lord, I, I'm afraid that the longer we're saved, the e easier it is to believe that I know how to do this. I remember days of being scared every time I stood up to preach. and Lord, I lean so heavily upon You. I'm just as needy today. Sometimes I forget that. Lord, forgive us for thinking we've learned how to do it. Lord, forgive me for thinking that it's just the big things in life that I need help with, like big terminal diseases or losing a job or the children are sick or something big and catastrophic. But Lord, in the moment-by-moment moment reality of life, I need You. Holy Spirit, the church needs You. Holy Spirit, I need You. Only You satisfy. Only You fill. Everything else leaves us empty and dry. Lord, I surrender. Lord, I, I, I just pray that this church, once again, Lord, just surrenders our all to You. That we are and will be and will always remain people of the Spirit. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. If that's your heart's cry this morning, would you join me? Would you join me? Let's, let's worship God. Let's, 
surrender. There are chains that will be broken in our own lives. There are chains that will be broken in society as we return to the Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's worship together. You know, as they continue to play, I just want us to, you know, you may want, wonder, you know, I, I just don't know what, what are the next steps for me? What do I do? Jesus said, so I say to you, ask. It will be given. See, you will find knock. It will be opened. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. To him who knocks, it will be open. Some people say, well, I, uh, you know, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I'm afraid that I might get into something cookie or weird. And Jesus said, if a son asks for bread from any father among you, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, are you going to give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? The baptism of the Holy Spirit is a gift from our Heavenly Father. See, it's not enough just to know about it. It's not enough just to hear about it. He wants you to experience Him. So in order to receive, all you got to do is repent and acknowledge Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And ask Jesus, who is the baptizer, to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. And by faith we begin to pray, believe you receive the gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as an act of faith, begin to open your mouth and declare the, the, the wonders of the Lord. It's that simple. Just the way you receive salvation, you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's for you, it's for your children, and this is for as many as the Lord our God shall call. What is desperately needed in this generation is a people empowered by the Spirit of God. Not a new trick, not a new philosophy, for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. You know what is going to get you through Monday? The power of the Holy Spirit. You know, you know what's going to get you through that diagnosis you just received? The power of the Holy Spirit. You know what's going to sustain you as you pray for that lost ch child? The power of the Holy Spirit. And you don't know how to pray for your child. You know how you pray. You just begin to make groanings and utterances through the power of the Holy Spirit. And He begins to pray the will of God over your children. You know how you pray for a lost generation and you don't even know what their language is anymore. You begin to operate in the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, church, what this generation needs is a prophetic voice. Oh, God, forgive us for ever being pulled down to make less than because all we had was an argument, because we became political. But God, let us be prophets in our generation, empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, fill this place. Holy Spirit, fill every person in the name of Jesus. God, fill every believer here today in the name of Jesus. Oh, Holy Spirit, river of God, flow through this place today in the name of Jesus. Holy Spirit of God, flow through this place today. God, fill every heart. God, fill every believer in the name of Jesus. God is calling us back to Pentecost. People of God, God is calling us back to Pentecost. God is calling us back to Pentecost. I say, hallelujah, hallelujah. River of God flow. River of God flow. River of God flow in this place. 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 Once again, let the dead places be made to live. Let the marshy places be made to live. God, let the residue of this world be washed away. Let the dust of this world be washed away. In the name of Jesus. 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 Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Oh God, fill this place. 
Oh God, fill our hearts today. In the name of Jesus, fill our hearts today. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Oh God, set captive free. Oh God, can set captive free. Let the jailhouse be shaken. Let every fetter that holds our arms flow down, Lord. Let them be broken. Let prison doors swing open today. I pray that addiction is broken today. In the name of Jesus, disease must flee in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Um, God moving in your life is not an action. It's what He does in you. It, lo it looks different for everybody. We're individuals. He deals with us on an individual level. He comes to you in the cool of the day, like he did with Adam and Eve. See, sometimes we wish, boy, I, could, I wish I could get back to the garden. It was never about the garden. It's about the gardener. He wants to come and commune with you. He wants to fill you, every part of you. See, even as believers, there are parts of our hearts and our lives, even in my own life. You see, it's a, it's a process. And as you grow, there's more to receive. And as you grow, you realize there's some things I haven't dealt with in my heart. There are things in my heart. There are places I still protect. And the Holy Spirit comes every day and says, today we're going to deal with this. That broken place. I want, I, want, I want in on that today. And tomorrow we grow. And, and He says, I want, I want to touch that. He just wants to fill you every part of you, every broken place in your life, every dead place in your life, He wants to make it to live. That's what God wants. And as you are made to live, out of your innermost being will flow that river of living water that will touch every life you come in contact with everywhere. You're not going to win anybody with an argument. When you bring that source of life everywhere you go, people will be touched and refreshed. In the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, in the name of Jesus, Lord, I pray that every person here would, would experience the Holy More. All that you are, Lord, in their life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. If you'd like prayer, we'd like to join with you. Uh, several of us be prepared to pray with you. You may be dismissed in, in the presence of the Lord. God bless you. God go with you. Have an awesome week. We love you.